Hey everyone, and welcome to our September live event for National Sewing Circle. We're once again back joined with Nikki LaFoyle here to answer all your sewing questions. So thank you for being here, Nikki. Hey, glad to be here. All right, so if your screen looks a little bit different when you're watching this, it's because we have a uh, sort of chat section that you get to enter your questions into it now instead of having to submit them. So it still is the same process. You can ask your questions uh, for Nikki over the, the next hour and just do that by entering them into the little chat box that should be there on the screen uh, where you're watching this video. Uh, so our first question is from Megan and she wants to know, if I have a pair of pants that I'm sewing, specifically pajama pants, and it calls for cotton fabric, can I use other fabric instead, specifically a knit fabric? Um, so short answer would be yes. Um, as long as, um, the, the ease and everything is, is going to be the same. And taking a pattern that's meant for a woven fab, woven fabric and using a knit fabric for it is generally okay. Um, as long as, you know, it's got, um, it doesn't have like zippers or heavy, you know, heavy closures like that. Uh, buttons and buttonholes don't um, work real well in like slinky knits because it just doesn't have the stability to support those kinds of things. Um, so generally, yes, you can use a knit fabric for a pattern that calls for a woven. You cannot do it the other way around though, because <laughs> a lot of times knit um, uh, patterns made specifically for knit fabrics have less wearing ease because the, the knit fabric, you know, stretches around your body, whereas a woven fabric will not do that. So if you try to sew a knit pattern with a woven fabric, it's, it's just, it's going to be tight and constricting. You're not gonna be able to move in it. Um, and it's just not going to work real well. So yes, I would say you can, use a knit fabric for the pattern that calls for um, woven fabric. Um, short answer being yes. Okay, and then a follow up to that one was the, um, how do you tell how much stretch is in your stretch fabric? So this question she was asking if it was, you needed to pick maybe a 25% stretch or less, or how, how do you determine how much is too stretchy to work? Um, so, um, a lot of times, so if you have a pattern um, that is for knit fabric, sometimes on the back of it, it will have a bar that says you need a fabric, you know, cut a piece and hold it here. And if it stretches to here, then it has enough stretch for the pattern. Those are super nice. Sometimes, you know, not all pattern envelopes will have that. So to, ter to determine how much stretch is in the um the, the fabric, cut a square or, you know, a strip going along the, the length of the, with the most stretch, the direction with the most stretch. Um, and you can, you know, draw a line or, you know, just measure however much you cut and then stretch it and see how much it will stretch. So um, it makes it easier if you start with like, five inches or 10 inches or something that's, you know, easy to easy math for easy math. Exactly. Um, and you can figure out the percentage that way. I would have to Google like how to, <laughs> I would have to Google the math actually, but that's like the, the basic, you know, concept to figure out your, the percentage of your stretch. So I'm just gonna throw out a number real quick just to give to give an idea. So the the only number that I can think of percentage wise off the top of my head is if you start with a four inch square and it stretches an inch, that's 25%, two inches, 50%. But I mean, aside from that number, I'd have to get my calculator. But so that's what we mean by percentage of stretch. Yes, that's, that's good. That's easy math there, uh, one to four. So yeah, that's 25% stretch. Um, so yeah, you can figure out your stretch percentage of your fabric. And sometimes the bottom, the back of the pattern envelope will say, use a fabric with at least such percentage of stretch. Um, so um, did I answer the question? Yes, yes, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I ramble sometimes. That's all right. We both get excited about fabric, you know. <laughs> 
All right, our next question here, this is from Sam, and she says, do you have any recommendations for easy sew Halloween costumes for kids? Ah, yes, that's a good timely question because my daughter Annabelle is starting to think about her Halloween costume. Um, What's she, she gonna be? She wants to be Black Widow this year. Ooh, okay. So last year she was Thor, which was hilarious and awesome, and I made her costume. So for that, it was not really easy to sew, but uh, I just I started with a you know a ready-made gray sweatshirt, and I stitched a, a red cape onto the shoulders, um, and we glued on like all the armor. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot more hot gluing than sewing in that project. Um, but an easy sew kids costume, I always think of like a, a bumblebee. Like that would be super easy, just like a, a yellow shirt and you can either stitch black, you know, black stripes around it or you can even use markers, you know, that's make it real easy. Um, but also, you know, as, as Annabelle and I are brainstorming costume ideas, she also loves princesses. She loves the superheroes. She also loves the princesses. So uh, she wanted to be Rapunzel at one point. And so I'm like brainstorming, okay, how can I do that? And any princess dress, you know, you can kind of simplify it down to, to make it really easy to sew for a kid. So like take the basic color of the princess dress and you can get that color in, um, you can get it in a knit to make it real easy, you know, stitch some elastic to make it an elastic skirt and just kind of, um, you know, do do the top in like a, a set in sleeve or something just to make it real easy and um, do just the basic design lines. So like Snow White, you know, she's got a, a yellow skirt and a blue top and then she's got some red stripes on her sleeve and just basic design lines, basic colors, and and uh, yeah, makes it really easy. I'm gonna have to Google princesses, because as soon as, I, I can off the top of my head think of like what any of their dresses would look like. <laughs> I have a son who's too young to really get into anything yet, so I'll Google that maybe next year. But just, we have a couple questions that came in, and I'll get to them in just a sec, but sort of a follow-up in terms of Halloween costume, because when I think of uh, Halloween sewing, I think of, stretchy fabrics, those really slick, almost wet looking vinyl fabrics, faux furs, like definitely not your normal everyday fabrics that you're working with. So uh, if you've never sewn a Halloween costume before, what is one fabric that you should avoid? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, it's definitely the time of year when you get into specialty fabrics. Um, but let's see, what should you avoid? Well, uh, a lot of specialty fabrics have their challenges. Um, I personally really dislike sewing on sequined fabric or, you know, fabric with beads and, you know, things that you have to remove from the seam allowances before you can sew them. That just seems so tedious to me. So I would definitely avoid that. But, hey, if you pick a costume and, you know, you're, you you need to use faux fur or you need to use a sequin fabric to make your costume, you can make it work. You can definitely make it work. Um, just, you know, Google some tips or go on nationalsewingcircle.com because I know Ashley did a video on oh my line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I knew you where you were going with that. <laughs> yeah. So I have done, there is a, there's several videos on working specifically with specific fabrics, but then I've done one on just working with difficult fabrics, which does cover um, sequin fabrics and those kind of things, which speaking of costume, I did make an Elsa costume once, which did require lots of sequins. Never seen the movie, but she showed me a picture. <laughs> um, so yes, there's plenty of resources on National Sewing Circle to, to help you work with any of the many fun fabrics out there. All right, our next question here, this is from Pam, and she says, what is the best way to enlarge a pattern to make it bigger? Um, so for enlarging patterns, um, if you wanna do just an all over scale up um, to, for grading my patterns, you know, scaling them up, I slash and spread. So um, it's, there are slightly different rules for different pattern pieces. Um, but you want to slash vertically in three different spots along the pattern and two horizontally. 
Um, and if there are, you know, darts and um, other features like that, you can draw your lines to try to avoid those as much as possible. Um, and you want to draw your lines, um, you know, where uh, where the pattern will need to grow. So in a bodice pattern, um, there's not a lot of expansion right in the middle. So you have your your um, slash lines more to the side than, you know, uh, more than right in the middle. Um, so uh, you slash and spread um, just little bits in each place to make your pattern scale up. So um, a quarter to three eighths of an inch um, in each slash area, depending on how many you know sizes you want to go up. But generally, um, you don't want to scale up too much at a time because you know your lines can get a little weird. Um, so spread. Um, you know, either horizontally or vertically first, and then make your other set of lines and slash and spread. Um, and that will allow your pattern to grow um, in uh, proportion. So you mentioned cutting your, or doing your slashes around the darts. If you're making your pattern bigger, do your darts need to be bigger too, or can you just leave those the same? Um, if the dart is um, kind of a, a large, I mean, yes, your darts do need to grow with the pattern. Um, so if, let's see, where would you, if it's like a, a dart in a, a sleeve pattern, you know, if you've got an elbow dart, that doesn't necessarily need to grow very much, uh, if at all. So um, in some cases, it doesn't really need to grow. But if it's like a bust dart or, you know, the princess line dart obviously needs is going to need to grow with your pattern. Um, so in some cases, you know, you can just figure out, you know, your elbow dart doesn't really need to grow, but if so you can probably avoid having to retrace that onto every size, you know, every size that you're grading that up. Um, but yeah, your um, uh, like bus starts are gonna need to grow with your pattern. Okay, and then how is this method different than just, I'm gonna measure out an inch on the outside of my pattern piece and draw all that around because that seems easier. So why would that maybe not work? <laughs> um, so um, the pattern, yeah, you, if you, you know, just like trace an inch around the entire pattern piece, um, the proportions are going to get off and, um, you know, your pattern doesn't need to grow the same amount in all areas. So you notice on uh, ready-made you know, commercial patterns how um, for each size that is graded up, it's it's not just like you know nesting eggs or those Russian dolls where it's just one inside of the other. Mm -hmm. uh, the lines kind of cross in some areas, um, but then you know at the hem or at the, the bottom at the side seam, a lot of times it is you know just half inch on each side. Um, so it, it grows proportionally um, in some areas, but other areas of the pattern don't need to grow as much. Like I was mentioning, you know, there doesn't need to be as much growth in certain areas like right here, whereas you are going to need more growth, you know, under the arm and, you know, in the waist. Um, so, um, yeah, that's basically patterns. Uh, don't need to grow as much in some areas as others. Perfect. All right, we're going to get to a couple more questions here, but I do want to remind everybody that you still can answer, still can ask questions. I know the screen looks a little different. You, there's a little chat section, so you can just enter those questions into there, and we'll work through them. Also, on this page, I don't know if it's above or below your video as you're watching this, but there's a little banner for our um, upcoming quilt challenge on our sister site, National Quilter Circle. We know we have a lot of people who like to sew and quilt as well. Um, so if you wanna join a quilting challenge, you can sign up for that by clicking the link on the banner and it's a mystery quilt. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. I may or may not have seen it. So I might be giving some hints uh, as we move along um, leading up to the challenge, uh, but I can't, I can't tell you the, what the whole thing looks like, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. So you should definitely join it. Um, all right, our next question here, Gail says, 
what is a Hong Kong seam? Um, the Hong Kong seam, so Hong Kong is a, a seam finish. So um, the Hong Kong seam finish is, so after you, you sew your seam and you want to finish the edges of the seam allowances on the wrong side to keep everything looking nice and clean on the inside and avoid fraying. Um, so you're basically, uh, you're binding the edges of each seam allowance, basically. Um, and binding is, for anyone who's unfamiliar with that, is taking a strip of fabric and um, basically wrapping it around your raw edge so that there are no raw edges showing. And that keeps everything, you know, super finished on the inside um, and looking nice and neat. And a lot of times you see it on really, you know, high-end couture type things. Um, because it is more time consuming and, you know, takes more fabric to do. So if you find a ready-made garment with a Hong Kong seam finish, odds are it is, you know, a higher end item. So what is, if you're, if you're the one making your high-end couture garment, why would you pick a Hong Kong finish over a flat felt seam? Um, so it would have, um, if you're working with a, uh, fabric that is um, heavier weight or thicker, uh, a flat felt seam would, you know, wind up being really too bulky. Um, so if it, if you're working with like a, a, a looser weave kind of wool or something like that, like a jacket, and uh, you you know, pinking, uh, stitch in pink is not really an option for finishing your seam allowances. Um, folding under and stitching doesn't really work real well on something that's got an open weave. Um, a Hong Kong finish would, you know, take care of a lot of those problems and it would not be super bulky. Just, you know, you want to choose a fabric that is a light, lighter weight fabric, but still strong. So like a, you know, a basic quilting cotton um, does really well for Hong Kong seam finishes. Um, cause you don't want to add a lot of bulk because you are adding some layers when you bind, um, that raw edge, you get, uh, four layers of your binding fabric and then the one layer of your seam allowance. So, um, definitely choose a thinner, lighter weight fabric for that. Perfect. And while I don't think we actually have a specific video demonstrating the Hong Kong seam finish, but we'll have to add one now. Um, we do have quite a few videos on actually on binding and how to make your own binding. And then I actually just did recently did another video, which should be on the site soon, uh, difference between single fold and double fold and how to add that to your project. So there's definitely enough resources on National Sewing Circle. So you'll understand how to put binding on um, and then just use that in the seam finish area. Our next question here, I absolutely struggle with set-in sleeves. They rarely seem to sit just right. Any tips? Yes, set-in sleeves are a typical problem area for a lot of people for a number of reasons. Um, set-in sleeves, so you have uh, on your sleeve pattern, you've got a lot of ease in the sleeve cap because um, you know, that fabric has to go around your shoulder. So you want some fabric to allow room for your body. Um, but commercial patterns, a lot of times add in way too much fabric there and, um, you know, too much ease for that. A lot of times there's, you know, up to an inch and a half of ease in the shoulder and commercial patterns. There does not need to be that much. So it's, it makes it really difficult for so is to set in that sleeve to ease in all of that excess and you get, you know, you get tucks in places that you don't want them and puffs. big puffs, yeah. <laughs> Which you know, is out of style. <laughs> it's not for me. That's yeah. um so first of all, you can remove some of that ease from your sleeve cap um just by um uh, let's see, I don't know if I have any. Sometimes I have little pattern pieces here. But I don't think I have any sleeves. Um, but you can draw a, 
a line uh, on the bicep line of the pattern, which is just an inch or so under the um, underarm point. So draw that horizontally and then draw a line centered down your sleeve cap to the bicep line. Um, and cut from the outside in. And then you can just swivel that cap in a little bit. And then true your uh, sleeve seam, true your cap to make sure that the cap is smooth. And that just removes a little bit of ease from the cap. Um, you don't need most of the time, uh, you know, a half inch of ease in the sleeve cap is sufficient. Um, depending on what fabric you're using. So if you're using like a wool, you're doing a jacket, more ease is good and wool is, you know, easier to, easier to ease in. It's a little more malleable. Um, but for like a, a cotton, um, cotton top, cotton blouse, half inch of ease is fine. If you're using a knit fabric, you can do zero, zero inches of ease um, because you know, it stretches in really nice and the knit fabric um, just stretches around your body. Um, so you can do that. Or, um, let's see, uh, it can be easier to set in your sleeve if you do not sew the underarm seam first. This is called the, uh, what is it called? There's a certain name for the method. It's like a I don't know. <laughs> just, I, I can't think of either. Uh, just don't sew the sleeve underarm seam. Uh, set the the shoulder seam in first, and then sew the the underarm seam, and then you can just go straight down the side seam as well. So it it kind of eliminates a step, and it also can make it easier to set in that sleeve if you're not working with this you know tiny little hole of your um, your arm's eye. Um, so you can have a little more room to work and shuffle things around and make sure you're not getting any tucks. So I always use that method when I'm setting in sleeves. I do as well. And I think I just always, just, I never knew it had a name. Like I'm sure, it, I'm sure it does just because set in sleeves does. So we'll just call it the, the easier way to insert sleeves. <laughs> but I have to point out, of course, we have a video on National Sewing Circle done by uh, another instructor we have Jill Case and she did one on how to remove excess ease from sleeve caps and so I believe she uses a slightly different method than you uh, use where she actually measures it and draws different lines I don't think there's any cutting in the pattern pieces so there's multiple methods for removing some of that ease but um, we have a video for it so check it out all right uh, Sam asks any tips for applying a pre-made seam binding um tips um, it's, it's generally, um, you know, it's, it's the same process, just, you know, open up a lot of times, you know, the seam binding, it'll come double folded. So you just have to unfold it and, um, it makes it kind of easy because there's a fold there to have as like a, your guideline for stitching along that first fold line. Um, and it makes it easy to, um, you know, fold that around your raw edge to bind whatever your, whatever edges you're binding. Um, the tip that comes to mind is not really about sewing it, but you want to make sure that the binding you choose is the same fiber content as what you are applying it to. Um, if the thing that you're making is going to be washed with any sort of frequency, um, you want to make sure that they will wash the same way and not shrink up differently or anything like that. Um, so that goes for, you know, um, it's a kind of a high concept thing is matching your fiber contents to make sure everything uh, on the garment or whatever you're making is going to wear the same and not like, you know, you don't want that seam binding to, to shrink up or something or, or whatever you have applied it to, to shrink up and get puckering in the seam or anything like that. So if you can match your fiber content. That is a great tip. Cause I never really would have thought about that. Cause I always just think of, Oh, binding it's cotton. It goes on everything, but I didn't. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh, I learned something. That's, and I know they don't, 
um, they don't make bind pre-made binding in a lot of different fiber contents. So I like to make my own binding if I'm ever binding anything, just because then I can either match it if I want to match it or choose whatever you know pattern I want to do my binding in. Because binding kind of comes in just you know solid colors at Joanne Fabrics. Yeah. So making your own binding is gives you a lot more options. Absolutely. And if you want to make your own binding and put it on a quilt, you should sign up for the mystery quilt challenge. There's a banner on your page to click um, to enter your email address and you'll get uh, everything you need to, to make this quilt. So if you've never made a quilt before and you want to try it out and then practice your binding, this is the challenge for you. Our next question here, how do you make the armhole in sleeveless tops smaller? What happens is the armhole is so large or low that it shows the bra. Um, so if you are, so if you're starting, if this is a ready-made top, so we have, we have different ways of approaching this. So if it's a ready-made top, um, you can just kind of pinch it in a little bit because as you pinch it in, you know, it's going to bring it up. Um, you may not have enough room to pinch it in because, you know, that also removes from the circum circumference of the bust. Um, if you're working from a pattern, it makes it a lot easier because you have more options to correct this. So if you have a top, so if this is your sleeveless top and you want to bring up the arm's eye, it's really a simple fix. You can just redraw your line. I'm gonna use my seam ripper as a pointer. Oh, fancy gold one. Yeah. From Pam Damore. Um, so yeah, you can just bring this up. So get a new piece of paper and place your pattern on the new piece of paper and trace it. So put some pattern weights on it and trace it all around. Use a, a, a tracing wheel or something akin to this to mark your darts and any you know pattern markings you need to transfer um and then on your new pattern um you can really just pull that up as much as you need to pull it up and then true that line in and truing just means to gradually bring your altered point back into the seam line and if you have um uh, like a binding or a facing for your your top. You want to make sure any changes that you make to your armhole, you also make to the facing. So after you change the the seam here, I would um, measure the new seam line and make sure that the facing will um, make any alterations you need to, to the facing to make sure that it will still fit the seam line here. Can you do those same sort of alterations on a shirt that isn't sleeveless, that does have a sleeve too? Like if yep. you just find that it's too big um, and if, how would you do that similarly? And if so, you have like a little uh, notch on that pattern piece, would you have to bring it in before the notch or how do you work around those? Um, so uh, like notches on the underarm of a sleeve, well, you have on your pattern piece that you just had right there, you have a little notch. Like if you if you redraw that line, do you have to move it accordingly? Yes. Um, so you want to keep the notches the same distance from the side seam, I believe. Um, because the notches on the underarm that match the notches on the sleeve cap you want to make sure that they match. Yes. So I would keep them the same distance from the um, from the side seam. So measure how far they are from the side seam and make sure that they correspond in your altered pattern. And yes, um, you would, uh, if this had a corresponding sleeve pattern, I would still do the same alteration to bring that up and then uh, make that alteration to the sleeve then. Um, to make sure that the sleeve cap in this area is still going to fit. And odds are you're not really going to have to do anything to the facing or the sleeve cap because um, uh, it's not going to change the length of this seam very much. 
just you know a little bit and sleeves uh, have so much ease in them anyway that you can distribute the ease along the arm's eye. Um, what it is going to do is it's going to change the length of the side seam. So anything you do to the front bodice, you also want to do to the back bodice as well because the side seams are still going to have to match. Perfect. And then Maria has a question here and it kind of goes along with what we've just been talking about with sleeves. But so she calls it, she says tips on stitching the sleeve in the open as opposed to in the round. I don't know if that's what it's called, but um, that is essentially what we were talking about previously, correct? Yes. Yep. So in the round would be if you stitch the side seam and the sleeve seam first, and then you basically have a circle that you have to stitch the sleeve into the arm side. So tips on stitching the sleeve in the open, so flat. Um, it's, it's the same process as stitching it in the round. It's just, it's gonna make it easier to have more room. Um, I just use, you know, I use a lot of pins when I, when I sew anything, but especially when you have to match, uh, you know, when you're, you're easing things in, so you have a lot of, a lot of fabric you're working with, um, and uh, a lot of notches that you have to match. So I use a ton of pins. Um, using a, like a walking foot is, uh, is kind of helpful in a lot of different ways. People, you know, associate walking foot a lot of times with quilting because you want, you know, your layers to feed along evenly, but my FAF, actually, this is the Passport 2.0. It has the integrated dual feed foot attached to it. So it's basically a walking foot that's just attached, always attached to the machine. And I can pull it up if I want to get rid of it or pull it down and hook it under the foot. And it's basically a little walking foot um, that feeds my upper layer of fabric along with the bottom layer. Because the bottom layer, you've got your feed dogs uh, uh, on the bottom on your throat plate kind of feeding the fabric along. So this is just something to, to pull the upper layer along as well and make sure everything is feeding at the same rate so you don't get, um, you don't get creeping so that your, your layers stay even. Um, that is, that's just always helpful to me. So in a lot of, a lot of situations that can be helpful. So kind of a general tip, a general tip, but. All right. All right, I have another question here. Now, if I get this wrong, we're going to have to get some clarification, but I have in my head what I think this person is asking. Yeah. But they say they have made several things using a bag from a certain bottle. Uh, they are now trying to make jogging pants from them. Where they live really doesn't get that cold, uh, and the bags are fairly thick, but they're wanting to know what they should line them with so the pants aren't just blowing in the wind. Hmm. Using the bags from a certain bottle. So in my head, immediately, I, I don't know what this says about me, but I'm thinking of the beverage Crown Royal and their little purple felt ah. bags. <laughs> That's the bag that I'm thinking of because people make things out of them all the time, probably uh -huh. included. Um, so if you think about that in terms of what they're making it out of, it's like a felt with fancy right. embroidery on it. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, I know someone who made a quilt top out of those crown royal bags because they're really pretty purple and, and they have new ones now that come in different colors do they have cream and gold? Yeah, they're really stepping up their game <laughs> so if you're making pants out of those what would you line them with uh let's see i like that they said from a, a certain bottle so. i know i i hope that's what they were talking about or that's just that's what i thought of <laughs> um so let's see um the the fabric does from my recollection of those bags uh the fabric is a little thin but if you were not worried about you know them keeping warm i would say you don't really need to line them um i believe they're just flannel aren't they just like a flannel a lightweight flannel bag well that's what it feels like to me i suppose uh, for some reason i thought that it was like a <clears throat> like a velveteen almost had like a little like a nap kind of we're gonna have to go buy some and find out what the bag is. <laughs> um, so let's see, the, I think enough, should I line? Um, 
if you want, if you decided to go the lining route, um, you'd want to line them with something that has a similar weight. So for adding a lining for warmth, you wouldn't want to do like a rayon or something, you know, thin and slippery, like, like a lining for a jacket. You want it to be kind of slick to help it go over your shirt. Um, but lining for warmth, you could do honestly just like a, a quilting cotton that would add a layer of, of protection for warmth. Um, and once you have finished with uh, stitching them together to make your pattern pieces for your pants, you can just you know, cut out an extra from your lining fabric and um, uh, stitch that together just as you would your pants and attach that at the waistband and have your lining. Um, and I would want to, I'd say to also match uh, the color as much as you can, just so that in case there's any visibility through that, that bag fabric, you wouldn't want, you know, to have a, a glaring white lining underneath your pretty purple pants, you know, um, to try to match that color. Perfect. All right. Our next question here, speaking of pants, if a pattern for pajama pants calls for flannel, but I want to use fleece, should I adjust the seam allowance or make the adjustment in cutting? Um, I don't know that you would need to make any adjustments there. Um, yeah, it seems like that should translate. That should translate okay. Kind of the same same concept as you know using a, a knit for a woven pattern, it can go that way. So a fleece is going to be more stretchy than a flannel, but that is okay. Perfect. I would say, I think like in my head, I'm thinking if I have a quilt, like quilt a lot as well. And normally if you're, you're quilting with fleece or something thicker, you make the seam allowance bigger. So you, rather than a quarter, you'd make it bigger just because it's hard to have a narrow seam allowance on such a, a thicker bulky fabric. But I guess for Garments, it really doesn't matter, right? Yep, you've got your 5 eighths inch seam allowance, which is plenty for that kind of fabric. Um, it would probably get a little bulkier, though, in the in the seam allowance area, so you may have to take that into consideration and do some things different if it gets too bulky in areas. How would you finish the seams on your pajama pants from cotton to flannel to fleece? Are you going to do them differently? Um, I would do the same for cotton and flannel because flannel is also a woven fabric. So that would behave the same. Um, for fleece, fleece is a knit, so you don't technically need to finish your seam allowances, but fleece also, it will roll, like curl at the edges after you cut it. Um, <clears throat> so I would, um, instead of double folding, I would just probably fold once and stitch, um, and that would prevent it from curling. Um, but also you don't have to go the extra mile to double fold because it's not gonna fray anyway. Perfect. Do you have any tips on sewing with fleece? Because it's one of those fabrics that looks and feels like it should be super easy to sew with, but it actually is a little bit tricky and it, it dulls needles and dulls scissors and things like that. So uh, what are your tips for working with fleece? Um, fleece. Yeah, I was gonna say it's horrible to sew. <laughs> it's so, it's tough. I was trying to sew a fleece blanket and there's just so much creeping and so much movement because it's got a nap, basically. It's got that, you know, kind of really soft, almost furry feeling, which makes it so wonderful for blankets um, and so cuddly for pajama pants, but it's it makes it a little tough. And it being a knit as well, you can get some extra stretching and creepage there. Um, and yes, it will, it'll dull your needle quicker. Um, so keep that in mind if you start getting um, skip stitches or thread nests or uh, flagging, which is your fabric kind of thunk, thunk. You know, the needle will make that thunk, thunk sound and your fabric will kind of start bouncing on your throat plate. That's a dull needle, uh, so change your change your needle if that happens. Um, and a walking foot would be super helpful 
when sewing fleece um, because as mentioned, it will make sure that the upper layer of the fabric and the lower layer um, move through under the under the presser foot at the same rate. So that will cut down on the, the creepage and the, you know, the movement of the layers of fabric. Um, use a lot of pins. Um, and if you find it's really bad, you can even baste on either side of your seam allowance first so that it really locks it in place before you get it under the presser foot and you get it moving. Um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna deter anyone from sewing the fleece because it's fabulous. You can make some really great things and no matter what challenges there are, just whatever fabric you've chosen, they're always surmountable. You can always do it. It just might take a little more prep work beforehand. Absolutely. And I do want to say, because I know we've talked a little bit about um, sort of different qualities of fabric or levels of quality in terms of fabric, and they, they do make different levels of quality of fleece. So they have, and my only reference is Joanne Fabrics, because that's where I shop a lot, but they have Polar Fleece, and then they have their Lux Fleece brand. Uh, and so it's, it even feels a little bit just nicer and heavier, and it's a little bit easier to work with. So there, if you're having trouble, maybe pick the higher quality one, if you can do that, or you can find that as well. And that might make sewing with, with fleece a little bit more fun. For sure. Perfect. Our next question here, Diane says, can I use a fabric marker to make pinstripes for a costume? Oh, yeah. I think you would definitely be able to do that if you get a, a white fabric marker to make white pinstripes on a, a dark fabric. I think that should work. Perfect. I don't, I was thinking the opposite, that you would have like a white shirt and then do the dark lines. Just, it wouldn't really matter which one, you know, if your white's not showing up good on the black fabric. You go the other way. Perfect. <laughs> All right, would you use a walking foot with fleece? That's, you did just talk about that a little bit. Um, I guess just to throw it out there, if you if you don't have a fancy foff like you do that has the integrated feed and your machine does not have a walking foot, what are some other alternatives to a walking foot? Yes, yeah, some other options. So um, there are different feet that you can use if you happen to have a roller foot around. I bet I don't have mine on hand, but it's a roller foot is, um, it basically got like a little metal steamroller kind of built into it. So it's got grippies on it though too, right? Yep, it's got like a, a texture on the little roller to grab onto your fabric and, and roll it under to help that move under the presser foot. Um, so that is an option. That's great also for like uh, vinyl, laminated fabrics, um, faux leather, things that are kind of sticky almost to help them uh, to keep them from sticking to the underside of the foot, but also could work for fleece as well, just to help keep that upper layer moving. Um, the, uh, the Teflon foot, also called a PTFE foot. Um, mine is just, mine is a plain white foot instead of like a clear plastic or something, it's a plain white. Um, and that's just got a coating on the underside of the foot to make it kind of more slippery which is also um, designed really for those faux leathers, genuine leather, vinyl, sticky things like that to help it slide under. Could also work though, the same concept for uh, sewing with fleece. Um, and let's see. So that's what, sorry, I was gonna throw in a follow-up question there because we're talking about fleece because they said, talking about walking feet and then it says, or needles, different types of needles. Just, I was gonna throw okay. that in. Yes. Um, so different types of needles. So your fleece, fleece is a knit fabric. So you'd wanna use a ballpoint needle for that. Um, ballpoint or a stretch needle or a jersey needle. Those are all designed for knit fabrics. Um, and that just helps, it helps preserve the integrity of the fabric because instead of a sharp point on your needle um, that may end up cutting the fibers as it goes through, the ballpoint needle um, allows it to kind of nestle in between the knit fibers as it's going through the fabric. Um, so yeah, if, um, 
if those if you don't have any of those feet that I was talking about before though I think I mentioned um, using a lot of pins basting on uh, in hand based on either side of the seam um, I did a video uh, on sewing with uh, velvet and I did a you know I did a velvet skirt at the end so a lot of these tips um, I gave in that video as well, and maybe even some more that I have forgotten. I don't know, um, but that's you know that was all about sewing with it, the napped fabric, where you get two sides, two naps together, and you get a lot of creepage. Um, so, if you want more information about working with velvet or things like that, there may be more tips in there. But I think those are those are the big ones on keeping that um, keeping those fabric layers from shifting around a lot on you. Perfect. Our next follow-up question to that comes from somebody who must have watched at least one or two of your live <laughs> events at some point, because they want to know if tissue paper can be used to guide fleece under the presser foot. Uh, it, you guys, it's like you know me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so tissue paper, uh, if you use it between the layers of fleece, that just kind of prevents the nap from meeting. So it, uh, instead of having the nap right side against the nap right side and you get all this movement, if you have a layer of tissue paper in between the layers, that gives it um, you know, a solid surface so that there it can cut down on the movement and the, creep, the creeping of the fabric. So, Yes, absolutely tissue paper. I can't believe I forgot to say that. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Perfect. All right, our next question here, Megan says, we've talked in the past about how you match your thread content to your fabric content. I'm making a silk dress, but silk thread is so expensive. What's an alternative I can use? Um, an alternative, I would say a, um, a rayon thread would be nice. Um, because it is, it's a very strong thread, but it is thinner and it's, um, it's, it's kind of shiny, um, because it's, it's um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not sure. It's, it's thin and it is, um, it's thin, I guess, is the basic because silk, you know, you want something that is not bulky, like a 100% cotton um, silk thread. Rayon basically kind of mimics the feel of silk thread. And it's um, it's not going to shrink. Um, it's just going to be nice and strong. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. Just a follow up to that. Why is it important to match your thread to your fabric? Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's not as important for, for things that aren't going to get used and washed a lot, but it's basically, uh, in, you know, in washing, you don't want, uh, you know, some fibers are going to react differently to washing than others. So, uh, you don't want one, you don't want your, your thread to, to shrink up in the dryer or whatever, or your fabric to shrink up in the dryer and your thread to knot and get puckering in one way or another. Um, and it just makes sure, it makes sure that everything is going to wear the same and wash the same and react the same to whatever stresses you're putting the garment under. Perfect. All right, our next question here, Carol says, my fabric scissors are getting very dull. Is it worth it to try and have them sharpened or should I just get a new pair? Um, that's a good question. I, I've never had my scissors sharpened and I don't know, I don't know how much that service costs, um, or where they do it. I guess it all depends on, you know, what type of scissors you have. Like if you have just, you know, kind of a cheapy pair, I'd say just buy a new, new pair. But if you've got like the Ginger scissors that are, you know, super nice and kind of a investment, it may be worth it to get it sharpened. And I, I think even um, 
don't quote me on this, but I feel like Ginger does sharpen their scissors. Like if you're you're spending that much money on, like you said, an investment, they tend to take care of their product. Yeah. Um, and I think you can send it directly back to them, I believe. Oh. So I will have to find out and I will let everyone know. Um, have you ever tried one of those, the little hand sharpeners where you just like put it in there and actually just use, um, you act like you're cutting it, but you're just sharpening it? Oh, no, I never have used that. I feel like I've used that a couple times and it's worked. It's it's like a temporary fix. To me, it's almost like um, you see, you know, chefs that are sharpening their knives before they cut like every single time. And it's kind of like that, like it does it a little bit, um, but it may not be a permanent, permanent fix. Right. Yeah. Cause I have a kitchen knife sharpener that mm -hmm. you just kind of ch -ch -ch go through and it's the metal blades that you're rubbing it against. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that would work for scissors because it's such a, for kitchen knives, it's so narrow and scissors are a little bit bigger, but same concept, I guess. So, yeah, I don't know. I would have to, you know, you'd have to do some research on cost effectiveness of both of those options. If it's not available, I think you and I need to start a scissor sharpening business. We'll just make that our trade. We'll just do that. Good, good ideas. We brainstorm here. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, follow up to that. Is it possible or worth it to sharpen seam rippers? Um, I, I don't know if it's possible. If it was, I don't know if it would be worth it because seam rippers are so, they're cheap. You know, you just get a new one. They come with all your machines. Yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've talked about seam rippers in the past, and there is a specific way to use one, right, that limits your possibility of damaging your fabric or uh, ripping further than you intend to. So what is the proper way to use a seam ripper? Uh, so however you can, I've seen people use them so many different ways. Um, I would say whatever is comfortable for you is good, and whatever makes sure you don't, pop a hole in your fabric, but I like to use it, um, this ball end first a lot of times, um, just so that I'm not pushing this sharp end along because there's uh, a great chance of catching that on the fibers of your fabric and popping a hole in something. Um, so if you can turn it the other way and use the ball end first, um, you know, just kind of pull open your, the seam that you want to rip and you can get that ball in first and just go right up and, um, you know, then you don't run the risk of damaging your fabric if you go sharp end first. Um, is there a video? I feel like I watched somebody do a video. On how to use the seam ripper? Yeah. I don't know if we have one on that. I feel like we have a video where somebody uses a seam ripper to open up buttonholes. Um, but so that <laughs> that was probably you. Um, but I, I don't think we have one on seam rippers. We might have to add that too. We have. All, I'm going to start a list of all the things we need to add add videos to. So the seam ripper um, is definitely one of them. Uh, just speaking of using it to open buttonholes, how do you make sure that you don't go too far and go past those bar tacks when you're using it for that? Yeah, that's um, whenever I talk about buttonholes, it's like you have to do this. Um, so you've got your buttonhole ready to open it up. Um, so I put put a pin just right at the beginning of each bar tack. You've got your pins on either side, bracketing the buttonhole, pins right through the bar tack. Um, so that when you get your seam in and push it to cut the fabric in the, to open up the buttonhole, you're not going to accidentally push too far and cut that bar tack. The pin is there to stop that. Perfect. All right, another follow-up to removing stitches or taking them out with your uh, your seam ripper. So when I was first learning to sew, my mom taught me how to sew, and whenever we would have to rip something out, we would always just pull on the bobbin thread and like pull the bobbin thread out and then the needle thread comes. So you have these two really long threads that come out and there's nothing left. When you use your seam ripper, you're cutting all those threads and you have all these teeny tiny little pieces. So how do you easily or efficiently get rid of all those little tiny pieces of thread that are now in the seam that you just ripped out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that can be annoying. Um, a lot of times too when I'm ripping a seam, I will, uh, instead of opening up the seam and going out at it like that, because it does create a lot of 
garbage. Um, I will, I'll just have the, the seam flat on my own side and cut every five or 10 stitches. And then you're able to pull out those small pieces and then the other side, the bobbin thread or whatever, will just come off in one, in one go. Um, but if you do end up with a lot of tiny little pieces of thread um, from seam ripping, you can use a lint roller to roll that up or you know a, a chunk of packing tape to pick those up. Yeah, you'll get a lot of little tiny thread. Perfect. All right, so we have just a few minutes left. So if anybody has one final question they want to ask Nikki, this is their opportunity to get it in. Um, and while we're waiting to see if that question does come in, I just want to, again, point out that we have a quilting challenge that I really encourage everybody to sign up for. This is through our sister site, National Quilter Circle, and it is a mystery quilt challenge. Um, so if you've never done a quilt challenge before, this one is exceptionally fun because it is a mystery, so you won't get to see what the quilt looks like uh, until the very end, but each week uh, of the challenge, which is nine weeks, you just get instructions for part of it, and then you sort of blindly make it, uh, and then when you put it all together, it's gonna look absolutely wonderful. Um, so I think everybody should join it. Nikki, have you ever made a quilt? I have never made a quilt, never. Um, the only thing I've ever quilted was like a pot holder. It was a really tiny thing, but I should, I should jump in, shouldn't I? You probably should. So this, our, the quilt, I, I, I'm not saying this just because I'm hosting it, but kind of. But it was all it was designed uh, by very talented designer Toby Lishko, and so I want to just say if you are intimidated by the thought of making an entire quilt, um, you mentioned that you did a. Uh, pot holder, join the challenge, make the first block, turn that into a pot holder, and you've dipped your toe in the waters of quilting. Absolutely. And even if you just make a couple of blocks, you can use quilt blocks, you can use them to make a bag. If you decide, you know, you don't want to do an entire quilt, you know, you can use those quilt blocks for, for other things. But once you get started on, you know, on blocks, you can, it seems like to me to make a quilt, it's, you know, you you do it in, in stages, you know, you get all your little blocks together and then it, you know, it kind of grows. So you can take it one step at a time and. Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. All right, all right we have one last question here. Um, it says, I have extremely hard time taking out serger seams when altering. Do you have any, any pointers on removing serger seams? Um, yes, so you've got all those different threads that you need to remove. There's a way to do it where you can just pull out one thread and everything else unravels. I don't remember Guess <laughs> what it is. What? <laughs> we have a video. Good. Good. <laughs> yes, uh, our instructor ZJ Humbach actually does an entire video on how to remove serger stitches. And yes, there is an art to it and she, she knows it and she does demonstrate it. So we saved you with that one. We have a video demonstration. I need to go watch that video so I can learn it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So we have some things to, to learn and we're going to start our scissor sharpening business. But <laughs> thank you so much for being here to answer all of our sewing questions. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it, got their questions answered. And of course, if you think of some later on, we're always available uh, through the website, on social media and Facebook. You can ask us questions there as well. And you can tune in again next month and we will answer your questions as well then. So I hope everyone enjoyed this and I hope you all have a good night.